Sorry. Welcome, Leonard. Second. We're excited to have you. This is Leonard Feldman, and I'm Tyler Crone, the chair of the 36. Over to you, and we'll start our time. Okay, so my name is Leonard Feldman. I use he, him pronouns, uh, and I'm, I'm very pleased to be here uh, and very grateful to you all that you um, take the time to um, interview candidates uh, for a nonpartisan position um, and uh, and give your endorsements. It's it's interesting, of course, that judges are nonpartisan, um, and, um, and and yet this process is so helpful um, because it allows us to speak indirectly, I think, to your constituents and ours. A um, little bit about my background. I grew up in the Seattle area. Uh, I went to the University of Washington. From there, I went to Harvard Law School. I spent a year clerking for a federal judge. And then I began about a 35-year career in private practice, first at a very large international firm, uh, then a smaller regional firm. And in both of those firms, I was largely doing defense work, corporate work. Um, <clears throat> and it clearly wasn't um, satisfying me. Um, and I left um, those firms to go to a small firm that had my name on the door, uh, Peterson, Wampold, Rosada, Feldman, and Luna, which allowed me to represent real people in real cases um, in situations where people had been wronged. Um, the question was asked earlier, why am I running? I'm actually running for um, two reasons. One is um, internal, the other is external. Internal reason is um, I found out in law school that the law and I get along really well. Uh, I enjoy it. I understand it. Um, it fascinates me. Um, I think that it will be extremely rewarding and interesting to be a judge. Um, and, I, um, and I also am running for external reasons, which very similar to working at Peterson Wampold, being a judge is an opportunity to do the most good for the most people. Um, and that has been a hallmark of my career. Thank you. Yeah. Now over to you, Alex, to ask the first question. Okay, I'm not seeing a clock anywhere. Should I I'm keeping I'm keeping time on a stopwatch over here. We haven't figured out how to get the clock big enough in the screen. I can put the clock also in my screen if that would be helpful to you. It's going to be tiny though. Uh, that would be fine. I'm going to see if I can get my own watch going too. Um, I actually it has to be Amanda because you're the host. I will um, I will try to figure that out in the next question, but let me put it over to Alex here um, to ask our first question. Thank you, Tyler. Uh, Mr. Feldman, how can you, as an appellate court judge, foster and promote access to justice? Yeah, so as an appellate court judge, our options are somewhat limited. Um, appellate judges are reactive, not proactive. The cases are decided in the um, superior court, the trial courts, um, and then they come to us with a, an established record. Um, but there are very important um, opportunities and responsibilities of appellate court judges. There's a recent Washington Supreme Court decision called Henderson. Um, Henderson was a case where there was very clearly some sort of um, racial um, signaling going on in the trial court by the defense or the prosecutors. And that's not unusual. Um, I worked on a case like that years ago where the defendants in a med mal case were um, using um, racial uh, evidence uh, as a way of potentially prejudicing the jury. And it's the responsibility of the appellate court to figure out what is going on, applying the Henderson case or pre-existing principles and make sure that the um, litigants are getting a fair trial. Thank you. Question number two goes to Brittany. And again, that was about one minute and eight seconds just for your timing perspective. So if you want to expand, we can also use that time for follow-up. Um, but Brittany, over to you for question number two. Hi. So. Um... Racism and implicit bias may intrude into trial court proceedings. How will you identify and address racism and implicit bias in rulings and verdicts that you will review as an appellate court judge? 
Yeah, so the Henderson decision is really important in that regard. And what Henderson requires is that anytime there is um, uh, even an inkling that um, racial bias, whether implicit or explicit, um, is being utilized as a tool uh, in the um, Superior Court, um, there, there has to be a hearing. Um, and so it's the responsibility of the trial court judges to make sure that hearing occurs. And then it's the responsibility of the appellate court judges to carefully review that record um, and figure out if any sort of thing like that is occurring. Um, and so the answer to your question is that th that's my responsibility. That's on me. When um, these issues come before the Court of Appeals, um, my clerks and myself we will be carefully reviewing the record, figuring out if there's something that cannot be explained, like the decision that I mentioned earlier in Henderson or the case that I worked on years ago um, in Nero. Um, and um, in the event that we see something like that happening, the remedy that the Washington Supreme Court has um, mandated is that the case has to be sent back to the Superior Court. The Superior Court then conducts a hearing um, to figure out what was going on. Is there a non-racial explanation for the conduct of the lawyers uh, in the trial court? Um, and if there isn't a sufficient explanation, if it appears as though racial bias was used as a um, weapon uh, against a litigant, um, if it looks like there is any racial bias that may have infected the trial court proceedings, um, then the trial gets repeated. Um, and I, as I said earlier, I think that's a profoundly important responsibility of appellate court judges. Thank you. Yeah. Question number three to you, Shep. What is, it just moved on me, sorry. What is one unconscious bias you used to have that you have learned about and examined? How have you addressed that bias so that it does not impact your ability to treat those appearing in front of you, your staff or your colleagues in a fair and equitable way. Yes, yeah, so um, as a white male, I have a certain background, I have certain experience, I have certain ways that historically I've looked at issues. Um, I have a real advantage in that um, I teach law school and I have these young students that come from a very diverse background um, and many of them are just brilliant. Um, many of them bring a very unique, uh, their own, you know, unique perspective. Um, and I remember teaching a class, we were talking about what's called interactive risks. So product manufacturers have to warn about certain dangers of the products they sell. But sometimes um, the products they sell interact with other products. And the question is, Whose obligation is it to warn about those interactive risks? So one of the examples is um, the interactive risk of selling hairspray to people who smoke. Um, the hairspray is flammable. Um, is there an obligation to warn that the combination of hairspray and smoking um, can cause great harm? The other is um, the interactive risks of Tylenol and drinking alcohol. Um, and oddly enough, the courts have concluded that there's an obligation to warn about the Tylenol interacting with alcohol, but not the hairspray interacting with smoking. And we were talking about that as a class, and one of my students who's female said, you know, the reason the courts have addressed those differently is that the judges have historically been men. That's not true as much today as it was historically. And so you, so you have judges saying you need to warn about alcohol and Tylenol, but you don't need to warn about hairspray and smoking. And I thought it was an absolutely brilliant observation. And I have those occurring uh, on a weekly basis in my class, and I take those forward with me. Thank you so much. Our fourth question today will be from Barbara. Thank you. <clears throat> How much time, hours per month, for instance, do you spend or will you spend educating the public about our courts? This includes um, being present or seeking out community groups, schools, um, other venues that are available uh, to the general public and would put you um, 
in contact with them. Yeah. Um, you know, we have an access to justice problem in the state. I think we have that problem in every state. Um, one of the ways that courts address access to justice is by appointing pro bono lawyers to litigants when they are in the courtroom, when they have filed their case, um, and it's clear that they need help. Um, I've been involved with that program for 20 years now. But the difficulty is that litigants often don't know to file a lawsuit. They don't know what their rights are. And that's where public outreach is so important. And I have always said um, right from the get-go in the materials that I submitted to Governor Inslee when I was applying for this position and with the interviews that I've done since then, that I would look for opportunities to reach out to public schools. Um, I can't give you a number in terms of the number of hours, but it would be significant. Um, both of my kids uh, were educated at Garfield um, and um, you know we have close connections there. That would certainly be one of the schools where I would want to give presentations um, either to an assembly or to a class um, so that people understand what their legal rights are so that when their legal rights are trampled, when they feel like something has happened that doesn't seem right, they'll know to ask the further questions and then they'll have the opportunity to have a lawyer appointed um, to do that work pro bono free of charge. Um, and, um, and I think that you know the system works much better that way. Um, so as I said, I don't have a number, but, um, but I would say it's substantial um, and it's a promise that I made to the governor when I applied for this position. It would be a promise that I would make to you all as well. Thank you Thanks. so much. So we have come through our four prepared questions, and now we have the opportunity for our e-board interviewing members to raise their hand and ask some follow-ups. Shep, over to you. And sorry, one point of clarification, you'll have a question and then we'll ask for you to for, use a one minute follow-up. Thank you so much, Shep. Okay. Um, thank you. Uh, I'll try to articulate this uh, as a try to articulate this clearly. As a follow up to question two, um, there are things that will occur at the trial court that aren't obviously um, biased or that aren't obviously clear racism. Uh, and I would think a clever trial judge who knows better would figure out ways to disguise the racism or the implicit bias if they're aware of it. Um, my question is, as an appellate court judge, how are you going to sniff that out and figure out if something like that is an operation that is uh, unfairly um, harming the uh, defendant? Yeah, most of the cases that involve um, implicit or explicit use of race as a weapon against a litigant uh, are the opposing counsel. You know, we have an adversarial system, and sadly, some people take that to um, the wrong level. What you're suggesting um, is that there is um, implicit or explicit bias from the trial court judge. Um, and oftentimes the way we see that would be where a trial judge's evidentiary rulings are very one-sided and unexplainably so, um, where the um, dispositive rulings on legal issues are one-sided and unexplainably so. And, and that is something that the appellate court can review very carefully. We have um, law clerks um, and three judges who all look at the same record. Um, and, uh, and, and that's something that we're definitely qualified, able to do. And, um, and it's part of our responsibility to do that. Hi, thank you. Barbara, you're next. Thank you. So you mentioned in your answer to um, my question about ed education, that you had promised Governor Inslee, among other things, that you would go to the schools and teach, you know, make a commitment to um, trying to teach about this. I'm interested in what else you promised Governor Inslee that you would do if you would care to share with us. Yeah, I'd be happy to share that. Um, I think that our appellate courts are um, uh, 
overwhelmed with the caseload that they currently um, have. Um, and um, you know, my experience is that I, you know, many of the appellate court judges were trial court judges before they were appointed. Um, I was an appellate lawyer and I practiced largely in front of the federal appellate courts. Um, and in our area, that court is called the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals. Um, and they do things differently in a lot of very meaningful ways. Um, and so one of the things that I promised uh, Governor Inslee is that I would look for opportunities to increase the efficiency of the appellate courts without undermining uh, the fairness and the accuracy of the decision making. And there are uh, several ways to do that. Um, the way the court processes its cases, who decides whether an appeal, a permissive appeal should be allowed, um, and how the record, the trial court exhibits and the motions and the um, transcript are handled. And I would really like to see um, our appellate courts um, um, improve their efficiency. And so that, that was a big part of um, the promises Thank that you. I made. Toby, your hand is next. Real simple, should trees have standing? Should trees have standing? Um, I don't know the answer to that. It's an interesting question. I um, I I teach um, torts, and we talk about nuisance and environmental claims. Um, and uh, and one of the issues that we talk about is why is it that fishers, you know, people who are in the fishing industry, have standing to bring claims uh, based on pollution. And the answer is because the fish can't do it. Um, and so in that particular area of law, which is admiralty, courts have recognized that fishers um, have standing to bring these claims, not necessarily on behalf of the fish, but you know, partly so. And I think trees is, is very similar in that they are not going to bring a claim, but those of us who enjoy the fact that we have such great wildlife uh, in this region um, can bring those claims on behalf of the trees. Hi, Amanda. Hi, this is related to question number three. And you mentioned the great opportunity you have in teaching students to uncover biases and then questions, but um, not specifically a bias of your own, an unconscious bias or otherwise that you have uncovered and how you deal with that. I was wondering if you could answer that. I, I, I'm sorry, I don't understand the question. Can you? So a uh, bias through the process of teaching and uncovering unconscious bias that you have. Um, the question was, what what is one of your own that you have uncovered? And how how do you address that bias and make sure that it doesn't impact your ability to be fair and equitable? Yes, yeah, so the example that I gave was a real eye opener for me. Um, there, there are reasons why um, interactive risks are recognized in certain areas, but not in others. They're what we call doctrinal reasons. Um, and so I go into many of these classes armed to discuss the doctrinal reasons with students. And sometimes I'll have um, somebody, as I said, maybe a minority, maybe a woman, um, uh, maybe somebody uh, with a fluid gender, um, and they raise their hand and they comment and they bring these ideas to the class. And we talk about them. And as we're talking about them, I'm sitting there thinking to myself, this is just brilliant. Um, this is a great discussion because we are all learning from it and I am too. And so when that happens, uh, I teach this class repeatedly. So as I teach the future classes, I'm able to take that into account. And when I um, confront uh, those same issues in my life, whether it's in my personal life or in my life as a judge on the court, uh, I'm much more sensitive to those issues because I've been educated um, by some really great students. Time. Alex, i am let you have the last question here and we'll make it quick because we're running up against our time. Over to you, Alex. Thank you, Tyler. I'll try to make it as concise as possible. I wanted to do one really quick, one really quick follow up based on something you mentioned in your introduction, actually. Um, and I want to preface it by saying that I'm I'm a practicing attorney, um, and I am before judges and commissioners weekly. Um, and I have noticed that judges and commissioners that have a background in, like, let's say, public defenders tend to like favor 
defendants or um, respondents and judges that have a background as um, prosecutors tend to favor prosecutors or petitioners. So with that said, how does your legal background and experience inform your judicial philosophy and how you would approach cases while on the bench? Yes, so I'm a civil, or I was a civil lawyer, um, and I represented defendants for about the first 20 years of my practice, and then I represented plaintiffs for the last eight or so years of my practice. So my hope is that I see both sides of it, um, and I can bring that to bear. That, you know, that's in civil cases. Um, Part of what you're talking about is, um, you know, what's happening in criminal cases where Perhaps there's a judge who was a prosecutor or a defense attorney. And the great thing about the appellate court system is that we sit in panels of three. So if one of us has a a bias that is not apparent to the individual who has that bias, um, the other judges um, have the opportunity, and I would say the responsibility to um, raise that issue so that the decision that we ultimately reach is correct. And that's a big difference between trial courts who sit as a singular judge and can be victims to their prejudices um, on the one hand and appellate judges, um, which we sit as a group of three so that if there was a mistake made by that singular trial court judge, the three of us working together can, uh, can identify it and correct it. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. We've been so delighted to get to know you. Jeremy, why don't you give a brief recap of what will happen next? And again, thank you for joining.